um, I am a Mozart fan, so hence my La Ciderem La Mano. Uh, here we will go hand in hand title, but it's really to stress the fact that um, these days I don't think we can understand how health or disease uh, come about if we do not put together our understanding of the environment, particularly the microbial environment in a broad sense and our internal environment as exemplified by what is living in our guts. Um, very briefly, an outline of what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you about the microbes in our gut and I'm going to make some points about how important they are in terms of the composition of the population of microbes in our gut and the timing at which these communities form um, and develop. And then um, I'm going to bring in the environment as an essential component of how the developmental trajectory of the microbes in our gut, um, in fact, uh, evolve and, 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 and develop over life. I'm going to give you some, uh, to me, very uh, poignant examples of uh, what microbes can do for you uh, um, in terms of determining susceptibility to uh, one of the diseases I know best and work on, which is uh, asthma and, and allergies. But that is a broader uh, theme. I'm using asthma and allergy only as an example, but uh, you could really swap that with um, other conditions, um, even, even, um, neuro, in, 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 and even um, things that have to do with our moods or with our um, way of thinking, in fact, that it, you know, so that our gut uh, immune axis, gut lung axis, but there's also a gut brain axis. And, and we will take some special populations that are, as an example, that are, is, I think, very specifically um, informative about all of these things and then how all of this, uh, I hope, comes uh, together. So um, let me start with a statement. Now, this statement is, is built on, on uh, really literally at this point, thousands of, of publications and lots of work from lots of people, but you have to start somewhere. And uh, so the, the, the grounding, as it were, and the pun is unintended, uh, of, of this whole presentation is that we know now that gut microbiome uh, is critical uh, for um, how susceptible we are to certain diseases, asthma being perhaps one of the best understood examples. And when I say gut microbiome, um, I am talking, let me see if I can use my pointer. Do you see my pointer? No, you yes, don't. I see it. Okay, very, very good. So um, I'm talking about both composition, as I said, and timing. The initial studies that were studying the relationship between gut microbiome and, and health or disease focus mostly on what is in the gut for obvious reasons. We were making a catalog of what is in the gut. Um, and only to be, of course, baffled to no end by its complexity, diversity, and incredible, uh, incredible number of entities that we have in there. But the theme that is emerging more recently has to do with timing uh, of, of the process of being in the gut. And the es essential point is here that in the very first two, three years of life, uh, that's when the uh, gut microbiome develops, forms, and there is a certain time-honored process that, need, that needs to happen uh, so that then by uh, approximately age three or four, um, each of us acquires that sort of profile that will more or less stay with us during our life. And it is essential that this process happens in a timely way because if it is delayed, uh, things are not going to be very good. So the model that we are uh, using and that we are um, proposing and that we think is correct is one in which um, a, every person, every individual receives a small inoculum of microbes from the mother, um, in, in part at the time of birth, in, in part around birth, in, in possibly even before birth, that's complicated and, and controversial, but the fact is that we have an empty niche 
and that niche is populated by this small inoculum of microbes coming from the mother. And those, of course, uh, rush to fill that niche, but they are not the only entities to fill that niche. That, that development occurs in symbiosis and in, in cooperation with seeding, with the accumulation of microbial uh, taxa uh, from the environment. And it is the combination of what is given to us from our mothers and what is given to us from our environment. And by environment, I mean the diet, I mean what we drink, I mean what we have in soil, I mean what we breathe in, that leads to ultimately the diversification and the formation of our gut microbiome. And this is what happens under um, uh, normal sort of circumstances. And what can go wrong are, are several things. One is that the initial inoculum from the mother doesn't have the composition that, that grants the formation of a healthy colony of, of microbes in the gut. And the other, and, and the two are obviously not mutually exclusive, but converge, is that whatever is coming in from the environment is also not optimal, is not protective. And the result of that is, is essentially two main problems. One is that the diversification of the microbiome is delayed. So we, we in other words, a, the child reaches the point of which the microbiome is formed later than it should, or and or is uh, also more limited. And we know now very clearly that these two parameters, the, the timing and the composition are critical to uh, determine um, uh, disease such that early gut microbiome diversification is both stunted and delayed in these states, asthma being one of them. How do we know that all of this happens? By the way, I'm just, there is an enormous amount of literature. I'm just showing some, some, some data just to give you a flavor of how we know these things. Um, and this is from our own work. Um, and, or I, it, surprisingly, but not so surprisingly in a sense, Already at age one month, if you look in the poop of a child, at age one month, so really uh, very recently after birth, you will find in those tools uh, microbes that are present in the environment. So there's a shared, very strong shared component um, that is there uh, between environment and the child. And this is different in different uh, areas, in different locations. And uh, I will tell you that the kind of microbes that are shared between the environment and the child's gut is also different depending on, on whether the child is on a trajectory to a disease like asthma or not. So this seems to be a very important uh, fa fact to understand. Now, a lot of what we understand it, and still don't, but at least the question that we need to ask um, about all of these issues is coming from studies that we and others have been doing in uh, populations that are protected from certain diseases. In our case, it's asthma because it's our disease of choice, but there are similar studies in other diseases where we found uh, something that it, it's no, uh, is now known, uh, widely known as the farm effect. And you probably have heard about this. This is the finding now super uh, reproduced everywhere very robustly that uh, traditional farming communities, and they stress the word traditional, are protected um, against um, uh, disease, complex diseases such as asthma, but not just only asthma, for, for instance, also inflammatory diseases of the gut um, and, and others. And uh, these are traditional, uh, typically dairy farms, but not only dairy farmers, uh, traditional agricultural environment, where the contact between the, chi the child in early life and possibly during pregnancy, this is a true picture that we took, and this is a pregnant mother, um, and this is the, 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 the child she already had, it. there is another one coming, and this mother works in the stable, tending to the cows in these small um, um, single family farms during pregnancy. So there is a very close and very continuous and very intense contact of the child in very early in life, at the time that is critical for microbiome development, with, uh, with animals, with soil, and with this uh, farming environment. And no study probably, I'm proud to say, has shown this, the importance of all this, as, as the one that, in fact, we did 
and, and published recently uh, where we were comparing two farming communities in the US, the Amish of Indiana and the Hutterites of South Dakota. And the um, interesting thing is that uh, this comparison in a sense takes care of many of the factors that uh, epidemiologists and population scientists kept bringing up. Oh, it could be this, oh, it could be that. These children are extremely similar um, in their um, genetic makeup because these populations are of European origins. They come from a very small region in the midst of Europe and an area that is altogether probably not more than 300 miles wide. So really a very small region. Um, they had very similar lifestyles, um, similar education, similar diets, similar a number of other children in the family. But um, there are two main uh, differences here between the Amish that are on the left and the Hatteras that are on the right. They even look very similar, as you can tell. But the difference is this, that the Amish are Tra very traditional farmers, um, whereas the Hatterites are not. They are very industrial farmers, um, and they they and so the Amish have single family farms. These are very large communal farms with thousands of cows, thousands of animals, versus the you know 15 cows per family type of of, of farm <clears throat> that the Amish have. And the other very relevant difference, relevant to us is the prevalence of asthma and allergies in these two populations, which as you can see is stunningly, I mean, these are real population is stunningly different. The difference of fivefold, fourfold um, uh, in asthma with the Amish being protected is in, as populations go, really remarkable. And what's remarkable is that th that difference seemed to correlate with environmental differences. Um, the, the fact that, you know, this different kind of farming seem to lead to quantitative and qualitative differences in the type of microbes that are present on those farms. Um, that if, you, if you look, if this is just a simple visual uh, depiction of, of the proportion of different microbial communities, and you can see at a glance that Amish and Hutterites, um, what is in the dust that you can collect from the soil, um, in, on the floor, um, uh, in, in the homes that is brought in these homes by these children is very different. And, and even more striking in a sense is the quantitative difference because the Amish uh, have six, seven fold uh, higher uh, loads of dust and microbes in their homes and therefore in the rooms, in their bedrooms around themselves as they grow up. Now, this in itself is not, was not novel when we did it. We knew that we would probably find this. What was entirely novel and, 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 and was really um, decisive was that we could demonstrate how important this environmental difference was because we could collect that dust um, and we could put it into a model system, into an animal, in this case, into a mouse, and we, in the airways of a mouse, we made these mice um, asthmatic and allergic, and we looked at whether there would be a difference in how seriously asthmatic or allergic these mice became, depending on whether they inhaled dust from Amish or Hatterite farm homes. Remember, the Amish are protected, the Hatterites are not, and here we go. The, indeed, in these mice, um, the Amish dust was sufficient, just the dust, just what we collected um, on the floor of these homes, which is very similar because we, we tested it to what is in the soil around the home, um, was sufficient to protect from asthma, whereas what we found in the Hatterite dust was not. So this was so uh, important that in fact we ended up on the first page of the New York Times, your, your local newspaper, um, and we, um, and, and, and the reason is that this was the, essentially the first time, not only that the link between the environment and disease was shown formally in a, in a very robust model system, experimental system, but also the fact that we could show that th there were and there are environments that in fact are protective. And, you know, typically environmental people worry about what makes you sick? We are worrying about what helps us um, stay healthy. And so that was also part of the reason 
this had such a profound uh, resonance with a lot of people. And I want also to say that, however, we found later and we are finding now, and, and this speaks to the paradigm that I was mentioning before, that, that, that uh, what is in the environment doesn't work by itself, but probably works by uh, helping the development of a good, um, healthy microbial set community profile in these children. Because we could uh, analyze what the poop of these children does. Um, again, in, in mice, we basically gave uh, poop from Amish children to mice that have no microbes of their own. And we humanized them, as we say, and we made them into Amish mice. In other words, mice uh, whose microbes are my human microbes and come from Amish children. Or we gave them uh, microbes, uh, stool microbes, from Hattere children. And again, we found this very striking um, difference when we made the mice asthmatic. We found that essentially there was no way we could make the Amish mice asthmatic. Uh, but we had a very easy time um, inducing asthma in these hatterite mice. So the paradigm that I was uh, alluding to earlier uh, seems to be holding um, that, namely, that both the environmental uh, products from microbes and the microbes that are in the environment and come um, from soil, from plants, uh, primarily in this case, and of course from the um, uh, animals that are uh, very abundant in this environment, the type of animals um, are important and the uh, and then what these children uh, are born with and it is the cooperation, the convergence um, biological and functional between what these children develop in their gut and what they inhale, ingest uh, and touch that seems to um, create a healthy profile um, in their gut and to, to be associated with uh, health in the Amish children. So that, and this is my last slide, it's, I think we couldn't agree more that um, in fact some of our best friends are germs and you may notice where this child is uh, sitting and I was smiling when I saw Susan's um, initial slides and, and because this child is sitting on the grass which I suppose is something that should resonate with all of you. And with this, I'm going to stop and um, take any questions uh, if I can answer.